So thank you for coming out. Thank you if you're brand new, this is your first time here. We wanna say hello to you. I need to tell you, uh, this is gonna sound a little strange, but today I'm not preaching, I'm praying. Praying, I am preaching while training. The church, because these Sundays in January are still our soft launch. We have not grand open to the world, though, if you're here, and this is your first time here, we love that you're here, but it's going to seem maybe strange to you that I'm training people for the arrival, but I'm glad that you're here. Can we hold that tension together? Are t- totally fine? Can we? So praying is preaching training, and what we're doing is preparing ourselves for what's about to happen during the grand opening season, February 4th, February 11th, and February 18th. We've been praying that the Lord would send us a harvest, and so we need to prepare ourselves for that harvest. And what I mean by that is that somebody has been praying for the people that are coming for decades. A mother, a grandmother, some parents praying for their children to finally show up to church and they walk in here on a Sunday, maybe for the first time encountering the presence of God, and we want to be excellent stewards of their arrival and minister to them the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. It's not about Illuminate Church, it's not about people, it's about Jesus, and we want to be trained so that when they arrive, we give them the very thing that they need, which is Jesus. Amen? If you're new to church, this is a talkback church. I say something, you say something. This is a Jesus-centered church. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, oh, that, see, now it's now starting. Come on. Is that a Colorado Avalanche hockey shirt? Okay. Oh. Can I get the usher team to... Uh, <laughs> the first person removed from the brand new building. What an honor for you, sir. Is that Mr. Voriotis? See? Hey, good to see you. For the last time. <laughs> Today's message, which is the first message preached in the new building, is entitled, He's Worth It. He's Worth It. Look at your neighbor, say, He's Worth It. Look at me, say, He's Worth It. Yeah. He brings joy too, clearly. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. I'll say this, I said it the last Sunday at the high school, and I'll say it the first Sunday here at Illuminate Church in the building. When you go to the mall, you bring your wallet. Did somebody say your husband? (laughs) When you come to the church, you bring your what? Excellent. Bring your Bibles to church. I want you to feel it in your hands, to be familiar with it, and not just trust the screen. By the way, you could also follow along in the message on our app, the message notes are there, and uh, you can follow along the message right there. It says message notes. You can't miss it. Matthew chapter 26. Are you ready? Verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Verse 8. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Hmm. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Notice we're in chapter 26. Matthew ends in chapter 28. This is very close to the end. Uh, Verse 13, truly I tell you, whenever this gospel is preached throughout the world, including in 2024 at 7899 Sinclair Road, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Let's pray. Jesus, we're lovers of your presence and your word. We pray, God, that you would instruct us from your very words to our very heart, that we might be transformed to be the church that you've called us to be here in Central Florida. We open ourselves to you. Come and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, can see this woman sitting in her home in Bethany, which if you go with us to Israel in March of 2025, you can see Bethany. You'll be in Jerusalem. There's a valley here, and on the other side, there's this ridge, and that is 
Bethany, you'll see it with your own eyes. The Bible will come to life right in front of you. And there she is in her home, and she's heard Jesus is in town. And somehow, through the revelation of the Lord, she's come to understand that this is the Messiah. And she is full of love and adoration and devotion for Jesus. So she's in her home saying, what can I give him? I want to bring Jesus a gift. She's looking around. She's like, I got, I got some sandals. No, he walks on water. I, I can bring him some bread, but he's the bread of life. So, And then I, I just in my head, I imagine she's in her living space there and on whatever they had in Jesus' time, the arm wall, the drawers, whatever, the hutch, sits this alabaster jar. And she notices it. And she walks over to it and she, she's having this conversation in her head like, this is the most expensive thing that I have. And then she reaches out her hands and she makes a decision. She says, he's worth it. She takes the alabaster jar off the drawers, drawers. And then I imagine her leaving her house there in Bethany, which you can see. And she goes out the door and remember, this is Jesus' time. There's no bikes, no cars. Everyone's on the street walking. So I imagine her moving like a running back, avoiding all the people, trying to make sure that nobody jostles her for she doesn't want to spill one single drop of the perfume. She doesn't want to spill the thing and the earth swallow it up in its thirst. She's careful. She's making her way to Jesus. And then she gets to the door of Simon the leper's house. And she has to make another decision. She's about to walk into a dinner party where not any guest is there, but the singular most honored guest to ever visit the earth is present inside the house. And she's thinking about walking in in front of all these people. Jesus is eating. He's got his filet mignon, and she's going to take out her perfume and just pff, on his head in front of everybody. Can you imagine the gall that it would take for one of you to walk up here right now and pour water on my head? <laughs> Who said that? The ushers? We have our second removal. Perfect. But she made a decision. She had the courage to go in and to do this thing extravagantly in front of everybody because he's worth it. And so she walks in. Jesus is reclining at the table. It's hard for us to picture this because we eat sitting up. They ate laying on their side. Can you imagine eating your Taco Bell down here? Yeah. You can't even imagine eating Taco Bell. And she stands behind him. And then it's go time, the moment she's been waiting for. She wants to show Jesus that she loves him. She adores him. She takes her most prized possession and anoints Jesus' head. Such a beautiful act of worship that Jesus says, as long as you talk about me, talk about her too. So profound was it to Jesus, how much he meant to her that she decided he's worth it. The disciples become hoity-toity. They're indignant, and they speak. Can you hear me? <laughs> it felt like I disappeared for a minute. And they're like, what a waste. Can you imagine this? It's Christmas time. You spent like three months of salary to go and purchase something for somebody you love and you wrap it up nice and you take it to the house where everyone's gathered for Christmas and you present your gift in an extravagant way. Like, here it is. I love you so much. And you present your gift. They open the gift and it means so much to them. And then auntie so-so over here, she's like, what a waste. Right? Like, what's going on here? 
So this woman dumps expensive perfume on Jesus' head, and the disciples call it a waste. A sign of worship is interpreted as waste. She looks at Jesus and says, he's worthy of my most prized possession. He's worth it. And the disciples say, it's a waste. But Jesus calls it beautiful. Who's right? The disciples or the king of the universe? Is this a waste or is this beautiful? I want you to know today that Jesus values what others devalue. Jesus values what others devalue. You note in verse 6 that Jesus is in the home of Simon, not just any Simon. He's got an adjective attached to his name forever based on his condition. Wouldn't you love that based on your condition? Here's Tim the warrior. Here's Tim who has vitiligo. You maybe not know that of me, but my skin color is going away. It's disappearing. I'm becoming more white. (laughs) If you're brand new, this is normal. (laughs) But he's in Simon, the leper's house. And you want to talk about social distancing. Go back to Jesus' time when lepers were in the land. We go to Space Mountain, we got to stand six feet apart from each other with masks on in line. You know what I'm talking about? Lepers had to live in a colony all into themselves. When I was in college, I did an internship at the Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas as a patient transporter in an orthopedic rehab uh, hospital. My job was to go and collect the patients and bring them down to rehab. And then I was learning from the therapist there. I was training to be an occupational therapist. Thankfully, the Lord saved me from that job and I have this job. Amen? So they had, we had these gate belts, right? Gate belts that you put around the person. You'd be like, and you have to touch knees and like pull them up to get them up and then move them to their chair. And then you'd push them along. You could pull up heavy people, even as a small dude, like just using this gate belt. But you had to get really close to them, touch knee to knee and pull them up. Well, up in the upstairs and the far corner, all the way in the back, three rooms leading up to this room, empty. Nobody was allowed to be in these rooms, was an AIDS patient. HIV AIDS. You remember that era if you were alive then? Some of you went bone yet, but you didn't get near somebody with AIDS. You were afraid to use the toilet after somebody else who used AIDS, who had AIDS. You were afraid of getting that disease, and so we put them far away from us. This person suffering already something orthopedic is now shoved up in the corner. Nobody's allowed to go there unless you're wearing the full PPE, and I'm talking like all head down to the toes. You're wearing all sorts of stuff to go in and get him. He was isolated alone. I remember going every time into his room to get him, feeling terrible about what I was wearing. Like, I'm sorry that we have to be separate. Jesus feels this full of compassion and walks into and dines at the home of Simon the leper. Because Jesus values what other people devalue. And he looked at Simon and said, he's worth it. There's another man who's been 38 years as an invalid laying near the pool of Bethsaida, which if you go with us to Israel in March of 2025, you can see this very pool. It's right there. And for 38 years, this man has had nobody help him to get into the pool to be healed. And Jesus walks by and values what other people have devalued. And he says, this man is worth it. And he heals the man on the spot. Jesus is walking through Jericho, which if you go with us, to, okay, you'll see it. You'll be in Jericho. You'll walk the street. You'll see the city that the walls fell down. Anyway, as he's walking, there's a full-grown man, though he's short, in a tree. And this man is in the tree because of his inferiority complex. He's short. 
He's hated by the Jews, his own people, and he's hated by the Romans, the people that he works for as a tax collector. And people, all people, devalue him. So what does Jesus do? (laughs) He values him. And he says, Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. Not just that, I'm going to go to your house and have dinner. Because Jesus has decided he's worth it. It reminds me of another story of a young man. He was born two weeks before his father died. Excuse me, two weeks after his father died. And he was born two months prematurely. So he's small, he's sickly, he has no father. His mother eventually, by the time he's about four or five, remarries another man. And this man says, I want nothing to do with this sickly child. And so he abandons the child and takes the mom away to another city to live. Child lives with grandma. Child, obvious for obvious reasons, struggles mightily in school. He has attention issues. He's super misbehaved. He's not doing well academically. Eventually, mom's second husband dies, and now boy is 18. They reunite, and mom says, hey, listen, I guess this is our destiny. We're meant to be farmers, which was their original trade. So come work the land with me. We will pour our whole lives, but at least we'll work together. Except one man saw something in the boy that nobody else saw. One man valued what everyone else had devalued. And he pleaded with the mom and finally convinced her to let him educate the boy. And eventually, the boy goes to the King's College or Trinity College at Cambridge University in England. The man's name is Harry Stokes. You may not have heard of him. But the boy that he looked at and valued while others had devalued his name is Isaac Newton. You might have heard Isaac Newton. Apple, gravity, world famous mathematician and scientist. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, I only heard of Fig Newton. That's the only. (laughs) Henry Stokes valued what other people had devalued. Henry Stokes looked at Isaac Newton and said, he's worth it. He's worth it. What are we doing here today? What are we talking about? Here's what I'll say to you. You come to church on Sunday mornings and spend your time here while others are at home sleeping. You fools. You come here and spend your time here while others are saying Sunday morning's chore morning. I can get so much done. Saturdays for the family, we're gonna have barbecues and football and whatever. Sunday's a chore day. We get up, we mow the yard, we organize the garage again. Every week it seems it needs organizing. Can I get a witness? Eventually you're like, eh. But you come here and you spend your time. Other people are like, hey, we're gonna to go to the beach on Sunday. But you fools come here. Other people are like, hey, I think there's some theme parks around here that we can go to. One or two. And so they're off Magic Kingdom, SeaWorld, Fun Spot. <laughs> we. It's great. And you came here. Not only that, but you joined the dream team. Okay, 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 okay. And you spend your Sunday mornings wiping other kids, other, par- other people's kids' noses and bottoms, if you're in the nursery. Okay, that's getting weird. Okay, we're moving along. <laughs> you spend your Sunday nights teaching students to become mature followers of Jesus. You spend your weeknights leading D groups or headed to worship rehearsal or, or, or you're out in the parking lot where people are giving you the one finger salute when you're trying to help them park at church. 
It hasn't happened yet, but it will. I've seen it, not at this church, another church. And yet you've done that. You know what else? You tithe. I know that because this is one of the most generous churches that I know of across the nation. People understanding that the tithe belongs to the Lord. And they don't give their tithe, they return their tithe because it belongs to the Lord. And so in faith and obedience, 10% of what comes in goes back to the Lord. That's what income, what comes in, 10% goes back to the Lord. 1% is not tithing. 11% is not tithing. 10% is the tithe. And you fools do it. Massively generous church. Every one of our staff tithes, our elders tithe. So many of you tithe. So what I'm trying to say is your acts of worship are looked at by the world and they ask, why this waste? You're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. You're wasting your money. You fools. I want you to know what is true of the woman is true of you this morning. None of it is a waste, and all of it is beautiful, gorgeous. <laughs> Simple sentence, but you can remember it. Nothing you do for the kingdom is a waste. Nothing. Why? Because just as the woman has come to understand, so you have as well that he's worth it. Others may see it as wasteful, but the Lord sees it as beautiful. What is wasteful to the world is beautiful to the Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi. In chapter 2, verse 17, he says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Paul is foreshadowing his martyrdom. He's about to be executed for the faith, and at the end he says, I am glad and rejoice seems to not line up. His lifeblood is about to be poured out, and he says this, if the giving of my life means that your faith moves you to also give your life away for the kingdom, then I am glad and I rejoice. And others might look at Paul and say, what a waste. He's a brilliant man. He was a leader at the highest level of the Pharisees, and now he's giving his life away for Jesus to the extent that he's about to be murdered, but Paul knows what the woman knows, what we now know together, that he's worth it. He's worth it. Jeanette Naylor knows this. 102 years old. When this was just a concrete block, she came into this place, walked into that corner where the kids are currently meeting right now, and at 101 at the time, just a young pup, walking in with her walker, put it aside, and 101 years old, gets down on her knees and begins to pray for your children, my children. Isn't that awesome to know that Jeanette Naylor has prayed for your kids? And then she gets up, gets to the other side, into the next gen room, all you students, she gets on her knees, that woman right there, and pray for you. What do you want to tell her? <laughs> what do y'all want to tell her? Here's, here's my point. This is one of so many lives in here of a life poured out. And I don't even have to ask her why she does it. I know the answer, because Jesus is worth it to her and her daughter. Praise God for you. When we serve the Lord, we pour out our perfume upon him, and we tell him he's worth it. And here's the best part. When you pour out your perfume by serving the Lord and tell him he's worth it, eventually the world sees and knows that he's worth it. 
Your devotion to King Jesus leads other people to King Jesus. Like, at first they think you're a fool, and they think it's wasteful until they see your devotion over time and the effect that it has in your life. And they say, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, he's worth it. I hope you understand the greatness of, air quotes here, wasting your life on Jesus. I want to invite you to waste your life on Jesus. I want to invite you to pour out your life for Jesus. Repeat after me. I'm going to waste it because he's worth it. Air quotes over waste. You're not actually waste. Are we together? I'm going to waste it because he's worth it. Look at your neighbor. Nice and loud now. I'm going to waste it because he's worth it. 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 Come on. So... Here's how you can get wasted here. (laughs) I'm going to give you some practical things because it's one thing to inspire you, but it's another thing to activate what we've been inspired to, right? I want you to join the dream team. Who am I talking to? Every single person in this room. If God wanted somebody else to be on the dream team, they'd be here. But when we pray, Lord, send us people who will help us fulfill the vision of the Jesus Christ, in this region, he sent you. He's counting on you. He's looking to you and the gifts that you bring to this region, which are spectacularly different than other people. Some people are going to serve over here. Some people are going to serve over here. And and together, we're going to be the whole body of Christ serving the region. The dream team is how we serve the region here at Illuminate Church. And uh, if you have a a phone, do I have a phone? No, I left it backstage. Interesting. I feel free. You need to download the Church Center app if you haven't done that yet. If you have the Church Center app, you can open it up. And there on the Church Center app, you will see one tab and it says, you can make a difference in the dream team. You'll see it. You got to scroll just a teeny bit down and you click that button. And there's a form there that will help you understand which part of the dream team you want to be on. You could put in like, hey, man, I want to serve on this team or that team or whatever. But listen, God has expanded us very quickly by moving us into the building. And we need your help to expand the vision of the house. Every single one of you. Just think of our kids' ministry, for instance. Today is the very first day that we've ever had kids' ministry at the 9 a.m. service. And there were a bunch of kids in there. We had uh, record attendance at the 9 a.m. service this morning, and it's just during our soft launch season. So they have to double the amount of people they need, first service, second service. There are many people who served one, attend one. That's the, uh, the model. And by the way, if you have kids in kids' ministry and you serve one, attend one, your kid's going to get a different experience at each service. It's not like I got to go to both services and they're the exact same. The meat's the same. The story, the message, the teaching is the same, but the experience by Pastor Tish, she's, she's designed two separate services so that those kids that got to be in both get a different experience. That's unheard of. That's incredible. Why is she doing that? Why is she doing that? Because she wants, she believes in the vision. Serve one, attend one. Serve a service, Attend a service. And your kids will love it. They're going to be over there having a blast the whole time. We need help in kids' ministry to teach those kids at such a young age to give them the gospel. It'll never leave them. We need people in our tech ministry. I mean, this, this thing is brand new to us. But the power of this thing, it's repeated out there on that screen. And you can see that screen from the road, by the way. We're getting so many messages. Like, we could see your screen. Can you imagine the opportunity we have to impact people just by what we put on the screen? What we show to the world? You can be a part of that back there. And you get to play with buttons. I just like that part personally. I'm a geek. Whatever. I don't care. The parking team. Our safety team. 
These are two incredible teams that we did not have really at the high school. We had the safety team just beginning, but we didn't ever have a parking team. You get to be the first people to welcome people onto the property and give them a great experience, and you get like a lightsaber thing too. It's awesome, right? But imagine the joy that you can help a person as they park clearly and you welcome them. I was watching our parking team out there today. They're waving at everybody. I'm like, I love you people, right? And by the way, I know driving in here was weird. The turn lane was closed for some reason, and you probably got some feedback. We're figuring everything out. We're kicking the tires. Pastor Kim later is going to tell you how you can give us feedback and we can figure things out. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for your love. But back to the parking team. We need more people there, and God sent you. He sent you, the safety team, making sure that every door is secure, that our children are secure, that we're all safe in here at all times. And if there's a medical need, our safety team is there to respond. We need people on that team. And God sent you. We prayed, and you're the answer. You're the dream team. Has anyone else ever invited you to be on the dream team? Yep. NBA ever call you to be on the dream team? <laughs> Me neither. The dream team. So please, head to the app, fill it out. If this is your first time here today, go ahead. Jump on in. We ain't shy. Come join our greeter team. Come be on the cafe team. Come help clean bathrooms. Serious. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a team that cleaned bathrooms? Christine and I went to Orange County, California before Owen was born. Actually, I think you were pregnant with Owen on this trip. And we went to Saddleback Community Church uh, where Pastor Rick Warren used to be. He's retired now. And uh, we did the service and we went to the bathroom and there was a dad and a son in there cleaning the bathroom. And I'm in ministry. I'm like, how did this come to be that you're in the bathroom cleaning? So I asked the guy, he's like, oh, we serve here every weekend. This is our bathroom. I'm like, do you go out? And he's like, no, we're in here the whole time. And they were wiping down the counters. They had like these little squeegee things. They were picking up stuff under the urinals. And you know why that dad and son do that? Because he's worth it. And they get it. The dream team here gets that. I'm asking you to join the dream team. Come on in. Here's three other things really quickly, and it won't take as long as the dream team. Number one, our fast, our 21-day fast that we usually teach about and have a lot of uh, buildup towards starts tomorrow. Hey, what? Right? God can answer your prayer today about how much, uh, uh, what you need to fast. Fasting at Illuminate Church is all about disciplining the flesh and letting the spirit live so that the flesh becomes submitted to the spirit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast something that I normally crave in my flesh to teach my body that I, I am disciplined over my cravings and I'm going to obey the spirit's promptings more than my cravings. I'm giving up sweets, all sweets, syrups, Honeys, ice cream, <laughs> chocolates, candies, fruit. I don't want anything to enter my mouth that tastes sweet for 21 days because the Bible teaches me that the word of God is sweeter than honey. And I want to experience that sweetness with the Lord. And so I'm going to have my flesh to be submitted to my spirit in these 21 days by fasting sweets. What is the Lord asking you to fast? It's personal. We have devotions that'll be sent out to you via email or social media, all, all sorts of formats. Be looking for that, but it starts tomorrow. It ends on February 4th, which is our grand opening, first of our grand opening weekends. We have February 4th, February 11th, and February 18th that we are grand opening. 21 day fast. So we got the dream team. Say dream team. Dream team. We got the fast. Yeah. During the fast, two things really quick. Number one, make a prayer pilgrimage to the land. At some point during the 21 days, I want you to come at any time, park on the land, and walk around the land as long as you want and pray. We prayed thousands of hours leading up to the building. We shouldn't stop now that we have the building. Amen? We're going to continue praying. So sometime during the 21 day fast, everybody in here is going to make a trip to the land to pray. Amen? The dream team? The fast? Prayer pilgrimage? It's hard to say. And finally, the prayer service. February 3rd, right at the end of our fast, we're going to have a prayer service in here on a Saturday morning. Pastor Drew and his team are going to lead us. It's going to be phenomenal, and I want you to be here. I want it to be the largest prayer gathering that we've ever had in Illuminate Church's history because it's the last chance we get to pray before our grand opening. And we want to open the building saturated in prayer, right, to the world. Amen? So say it after me. Dream team. Fast, Fast. Prayer, pilgrimage. prayer pilgrimage, prayer service. I love you. So good. 
So good. So to wrap up today, we're going to celebrate communion. If you have your elements, if you would please go ahead and prepare them by opening up and making all the foil sounds over. If you need elements, just raise your hand like this. If you want gluten-free elements, then wash the window like this. This is gluten-free. This is I need this. All right, they're coming to you. The usher's going to come to you. Just be patient. Uh, do we have any more ushers that can help with rapidito? We need some over here. Eli, is that you? Cook? Yeah, Eli, run back there and get a few. Eli, cook? Can you run back there and get a few for the people right around you? I know you're a servant. That's why I asked you. This is a dream team member right here. Why is he getting... Yep, yep, yep. Just take a few. There you go. Pass them around. Perfect. All right down here. Down front, please. Anyone else? Bree, is your hand up? Or are you just saying hi? They're coming. Good. I want to make sure everyone is set. If you would, take out the wafer and hold it there in your hand. These are symbols, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, upon which our salvation was purchased. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he lifted it up and he gave thanks and he broke it saying, this is my body broken for you. His body broken for you. Every time you eat of this, he says, remember me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the broken body of our Savior. And today we remember. In Jesus' name, let's eat. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he lifted it up and he says, this is the cup of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of of sins. As often as you drink, drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And I want you to remember this today. As he poured out his blood, he was saying to you, you're worth it. You're worth it. And we drink today to remember that he's worth it. Father, bless this blood, this juice. It's not actual blood. And we remember our forgiveness, the setting free from bondage of sin and shame and brokenness the blood of Jesus. In his name, let us drink. Lord, for your salvation and for so many other things, we give you thanks and praise for this first service we've held in your new building that you've loaned to us. Father, we say thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. I pray that you would stir up hearts now to pour out ourselves to you just as the woman did as she poured the anointing oil on you and 2,000 plus years later, we're still thinking about her and inspired by her to do the same. You are worth it. You are worth it. You are worth it. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, amen, amen.